Thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to present our work, with, which focuses on completely non-conventional organism. It's the underground mammal, the subterranean morret, or otherwise we call it spalax. <clears throat> subterranean life is quite common on Earth, with many vertebrates and invertebrates inhabit underground soil, caves, and underground waters. Uh, among mammals, there are representatives of three different orders, rodents, like spalax, insectivores, uh, like mole in Europe and America, and the marsupials, like the marsupial mole. Uh, all are highly specialized uh, species. They share convergent adaptations to their common ecology, yet they display divergent traits uh, to meet their ne specific niches. And all had probably a good reason to go underground starting about 40 million years ago. Um, among them is this uh, the blind moret or spalax, like I said. It's common in our area in the Middle East, it's solitary, uh, blind with no external eyes, uh, which spends its entire life underground in its individual self-constructed burrow system. Actually, it's very rare to see them outside. And instead, we can see this landscape design in the shape of these long lines of uh, soil mounds in the fields. Uh, and this one in the middle here would try to cross beneath the road. Uh, probably it looks like the safest way to do that, but it encountered this uh, plastic road sign that came on its way. And in some fields, with poor drain of water, they build these big special constructions um, used as a flood refuge. It includes a nest inside and food storage, sanitary chambers, and very special construction. And <clears throat> but it is annoying for farmers, especially when harvesting their crops, since they have to raise the razors of the combine, and that causes a loss of straw. But for us, the researchers, uh, this is an interesting group performing very hard work underground. And how hard is the work performed? One animal uh, of 150 gram body mass can lift up to 800 gram annually, kilogram, sorry. And uh, that is more than 500 ton for my body mass. And all this is performed under fluctuating oxygen, uh, both seasonal and daily, when the animals dig to extend their area and to accumulate food, it pushes the soil back so it's trapped for a while in a segment uh, of the burrow. And here we can see the oxygen goes down to goes down to seven percent, uh, which is about one third of the atmospheric, and equivalent to about nine thousand meters altitude. And obviously, living in such harsh environment <coughs> turns out to be possible also for a long time, beyond all expectations. So hypoxia tolerance is not the only characteristic of spalax. It is also a long-lived mammal that can reach up to 20 years in captivity. And as we know, lifespan correlates with body mass for the vast majority of mammals, but there is a very special a group over here with a small body mass and a long lifespan. Uh, these are the outlayers, including bats and spalax in our case. Uh, diversity uh, exists not only in lifespan, but also in susceptibility to cancer. We can see susceptible species here like mice, human, uh, and resistant species on the right uh, list like elephants and whales, and the spalax joins the list here with this group. And for some animals, like the big cetaceans, there are some explanations, at least one is the mutation rate. Here, the authors show that the substitutions per site per million years is lower in cetaceans than in other animals. And all these observations raise the questions about spalax, whether it resists cancer, and how does it support its longevity? And the important question is, what was the driver for all these adaptations? So we have been growing spalax and keeping them in an animal house for, for years, and took us time to realize that we had thousands of them 
in the animal facility and none obviously died of cancer. In 10 years ago, we tried to induce cancer by chemical carcinogens, which was very successful in mice. Within two months, they developed this carcinoma phenotype and was completely unsuccessful with spalax when all the animals within two months healed their wounds. And another potent carcinogen called 3MCA also was applied and it induced fibrosarcoma cancer successfully in mice and rat within four months. And we had to wait up to two years until we got uh, two cases out of 22 uh, of this malignant transformation in spalax. So big delay in time and less than 10% success. And also on cell culture uh, level in fibroblast as an important player in the tumor microenvironment. Here we see the ability of the cells to restrict cancer cells growth and co-culture model over here with cancer cells in soft agar over here where cancer cells are grown in colonies above a layer of, of spalax or other cells and in metrigel, all showing one thing, non-permissive microenvironment by spalax. And looking for some explanations, we carried out three transcriptome studies on brain, muscle, and liver. And among the gene ontology terms enriched in Spalax brain were those related to DNA repair, here marked in this uh, green rectangle. In, also in heat map, on the heat map, you can see mRNA abundance of genes related to DNA repair. Here, blue and, the, uh, and black. Uh, represent high expression of spalax of all ages. Here are ages in months when compared to red on the right hand. And here is the Fanconi anemia pathway, which is one major uh, guard of the genome. And all labeled genes in red here are overrepresented in spalax. And also in muscle transcriptome, we can see the Fanconi anemia genes here, tens to hundreds of times more higher in spalax uh, muscle. And another work carried out on liver, uh, we can see mRNA quantities plotted here in hypoxia versus normoxia. And we can see the uh, count of the transcripts uh, for each gene. And in blue, you can see the unchanged, uh, nicely plotted here, unchanged genes. And in the red, you can see with the dots, around are the differentially expressed genes. So we see in that in spalax is more stable and probably more adequate response with less differentially expressed genes. But among these genes, <coughs> again, we can see here in the liver, the Fanconi anemia genes overrepresented in spalax in red. And asking the question why spalax needs an enhanced DNA repair, the answer comes from this illustration over here. Genotoxic molecules, endogenous ones, increase with each cycle of hypoxia and reoxygenation. So we can see one peak of reactive oxygen species coming out when the oxygen is declining, and then another peak of frost comes out when the oxygen comes back. And an organism that is repeatedly exposed to these cycles like spalax, uh, like I said, each digging activity includes periods when the burrow is clogged from both sides and the animal is trapped in the middle. And besides, each rainfall flooding may cause longer period of hypoxia when soil permeability is shut. And such organism must have evolved efficient mechanism to cope with the genotoxic stress. And so far we have seen, we have seen these differences in vivo uh, until PhD student Vered Domankovic came to the lab to check in vitro in cell culture model and see what's the repair capacity of these cells, especially when they are, when they are challenged. And she treated cells with hydrogen peroxide, different concentration here in different colors, uh, and tested viability of the cells. Uh, she used the hydrogen peroxide and she receives the picture uh, uh, over here, red on the top and spalax uh, on the bottom. Red cells obviously cannot withstand especially high concentration. The cells collapse and die, uh, eventually die. 
Uh, well, Spalax cells can withstand even the highest concentration and the viability of the cells goes down only to about 70% in both normoxia and hypoxia. And repeating the experiment with other types of genotoxic stress like UV over here, different dose, doses or uh, uh, doses of UVC and gen genotoxic hemotherapy agent uh, etoposide. Uh, also all show superiority of spalax in blue everywhere spalax is superior to red cells in viability uh, back to peroxide uh, followed by comet assay in this assay we see the nuclei of the cells treated with peroxide the nuclei containing double strain or single strain breaks uh, we can see a smear when they are exposed to e electrophoresis so they leave a tail behind uh, Spalax cells here on the right show recovery, fast recovery from this stress, while red cells here you can see even after three hours are still basically dragging a tail behind. Uh, another method or another approach is the, uh, 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 the nuclear marker gamma H2X. This is a phosphorylation of histone H2X. Uh, that is a good marker for double strand breaks and here we can sh we can see less damage in spalax in this staining here on top and more in red cells i hope you can see the green uh, staining and uh, this is the quantitative analysis uh, and the last method used was the host cell reactivation which uh, uh, is basically the introduction of injured plasmid priorly injured plasmid in in uh, in the tube in the plate introduced into the cells and monitored for recovery and the recovery will give uh, the gfp signal this green signal here and what we can see that spalax cells uh, rapidly uh, repair uh, marked by this expression of gfp whether the plasmid was injured by uv or by peroxide with less efficient and slow repair by red cells and well we know from many works that dna damage especially when induces persistent dna damage response here drives senescence and however senescence is pleiotropic it can suppress indeed neoplastic transformation and malignant transformations but also drives the inflammation phenotype to which age-related diseases are attributed and that's since cellular senescence is always accompanied by inflammatory secretome that is termed senescence associated secretory phenotype or SASP and, and SASP creates this pro-inflammatory microenvironment and to address these questions came Amani uh, our former PhD student who is doing her postdoctorate studies now uh, together with my colleague Irena Manov to study these parameters and they designed two setups of the experiment replicative senescence here just grow the cells until they reach the senescent state and induced senescence by etoposide uh, the induction and recovery period of five days and then test for all uh, 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 essays and turns out that spalax can easily reach senescence at their fifth to sixth passage pretty much like mouse cells the human cells take uh, longer than that uh, young cells keep proliferating well while senescent cells stop proliferating you can see also by molecular markers like p21 p53 spalax human and mouse pretty much the same they can reach the senescence phenotype easily. Uh, other markers like the beta-gal staining here in quantitative mode on the right hand and EDU incorporation. This is a nucleotide that is incorporated to cell to proliferating cells. And you can see that it ceases proliferation when, it's, uh, uh, when senescence is induced. So all show senescence in spalax cells. However, when we look at the DNA damage marked by 
again, the phosphorylation of gamma H2X of this histone. Uh, we saw the familiar picture of less damage in spalax, more damage in human cells, and more damage in mouse cells, and here in quantitative. But the, here comes the, the game changer uh, uh, for spalax. Expression of the most studied and common inflammatory factors like interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 was not detected in spalax cells. Here we cannot see uh, either in uh, replicative senescence or induced senescence unless we really increase the stimulation threshold by applying this uh, uh, condition media from the aggressive cell line uh, MDAMB231 here. Here we can see the expression of these factors. Uh, on the other side, here on the right hand, uh, we see the expression of the anti-inflammatory interleukin-10 that was not detected in other species. And looking in vivo also, uh, when in revisiting the transcriptome data uh, that we did before, here we can see the reduced expression of SASP and inflammation-related genes in spalax uh, in a less uh, amplitude than red. Here you see in red, you see the spalax all over. And when we designed the experiment, we tested the interleukin-6 in aging liver. Interleukin-6 was hardly detected in spalax cells here in young individuals and in old individuals when compared to red and blue. And to summarize this change of the game that was never reported before in the literature, the dogma about the coupled processes between inflammation and senescence uh, uh, is changed by spalax. Now we know that spalax managed to basically uncouple these processes or simply cut the chain so that they don't run together anymore. Uh, and the suggested model for cellular senescence in spalax is that efficient DNA repair here uh, with non-canonical non-inflammatory secretome of the cells create more stable microenvironment, supporting healthy aging uh, without inflammation, basically, and altogether suppress malignant transformation. Uh, and the overall hypothesis about major adaptations in spolax is that the tolerance to hypoxia uh, basically uh, drove efficient DNA repair here. Uh, that in turn affected cellular senescence and the transmission of senescence to the neighboring cells and altogether shaped basically longevity and resistant cancer resistance phenotype observed in spalax. And with this, I would like to thank all dedicated people with whom I had the honor to work and to our sponsors over here and to thank you for listening. <laughs>